Good morning. Hey, let me say this before I say anything else. Ladies, we have a woman's retreat coming. Get signed up. It's going to be awesome and incredible. And let me <clears throat> congratulate those of you that got baptized. What a great, significant thing uh, to do. I, uh, I love that. I love what it represents and I love what it means and what I think God's going to do in following up on your obedience. So way to go. I'm Dave. I pastor this network of churches called Yakima Foursquare. We're in Walla Walla. Have planted a church in the Tri-Cities. We're in Sunnyside, East Valley. We have a church partner in Sela Covenant. Uh, we planted a church in West Valley. We're talking to a couple that wants to plant on the east side of Yakima. So that's the network. And then I'm also the associate district supervisor. So I oversee 200 plus churches from North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Washington. And this is my home church and I still get to hang out and preach every once in a while. So thanks for having me. Uh, we're in a series called Goliath Must Fall, looking at the story of David and, Cal and Goliath. Uh, reminded that uh, this week we celebrate 9-11 and in the craziness of uh, the world right now, the craziness of our politics, the craziness of the local issues, and on top of all of that, life happens to each of us individually, and giants form in our life, strongholds form using our rooted uh, rhythms language. And here's what I want you to understand as we continue to talk about those giants, we start to identify them, we start to talk about them. You and I can walk free of the giants in our lives. We can walk free. It's possible, it's real, that we can live free from those things that would hinder our lives. So here's my question, do you believe that? Because it doesn't matter what I believe, what matters is what you believe. What are the things in your life that are keeping you from living as God would have you live your life? I want to talk specifically today about the giant of fear. I'm entitled this, Fear Must Fall. And I'm not pulling giants out of the hat. I'm looking right at the story of David and Goliath, and I'm finding this spirit of fear pulled right out of the text. And I'll remind you, right in the middle of this story is this statement. On hearing the Philistines' words, so the giant is taunting. He's taunting the people. He's taunting their king. He's taunting their God. And he does it for 40 straight days. And he's saying to them, taunting them. It says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, terrified is a strong fear word. And the key word in this phrase is, in this sentence is, on hearing, they're hearing this. They're hearing this. It's becoming part of who they are. What they heard terrified them. And then later in the story, it says this, whenever the Israelites saw the man, so he's walking down in the valley, Philistines on this hill, Israelites on this hill, this nine foot nine uh, giant walks down and he starts taunting. And it says, whenever they saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Fear, what they saw caused them to be fearful, to flee. Now fear is a natural human emotion. Fear in and of itself is a natural thing. It's not a sin. It's a defense mechanism that engages when we are threatened. I was walking uh, through my neighborhood and this snarling, big, massive dog starts running at me. I decided very quickly to put something between me and that dog. That just happened naturally. It just seemed like the right thing to do in that moment. And that's part of how fear works. We make a decision to fight or we make a decision to flee or flight. Fight or flight, it comes. We've been training and preparing ourselves for an active shooter situation, which is sadly part of what we have to do in the culture that we live in. And if you're real close to the action, you better fight. If you're far away from the action, you got to flee. If you're in the middle of the things you should hide or something, you got to do all of these things. When something threatens you uh, physically, when something threatens you emotionally, we size it up, we decide what we should do, either run or stay and fight. Uh, Susie and I had our three-year-old identical twin granddaughters for a month, and we got tired. 
And we got confused in this particular situation, so we just decided a couple of different times to sit and fight. We just, oh, yeah, you want to make something of it? Uh Uh-huh, okay, well, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And we realized we're scaring all the people around us, but we're just too tired to even be smart. And how many of you guys know that happens to us in life, doesn't it? It just happens. It just happens. You make poor, poor decisions. Fear causes you to make horrible decisions. But, again, it's a natural defense mechanism. The trouble with this text and in this story is that the giant came for 40 days and 40 nights to say the same thing over and over, the same taunt over and over, so everybody had plenty of time to work through what was happening and to look at the track record of God and make a different decision. But they didn't because the spirit of fear overwhelmed them. They couldn't think through. Now, again, fear isn't bad. I am a former Young Life staff person. I am now, again, a volunteer leader at Eisenhower High School with Young Life. And years ago, I took a bunch of Young Lifers on a hiking beyond trip, and I'm afraid of heights, and we went from sea level to the top of Mount Albert, which was over 11,000 feet. And at the top of Mount Albert, the peak is about as big as this little outcropping, loose rocks, and it goes thousands of feet straight down, straight down. And I had kids walking up to the edge of that and just looking over it like it was nothing. I'm crawling just to say that I've been to the top. I I can't look over the edge. I'm, I'm roped in. Please leave that rope on me. Please. All the way up that hill for seven, it took us about three days to get up, and and, and it was a seven-day trip, and I was saying to myself, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I I mean, just over and over, and I didn't know this, but have you ever seen the movie Jerry Maguire where the little boy says to, to Jerry Maguire, bees can smell fear? Do you remember that, one of my favorite lines? Well, we actually, in the study that I've been doing, we excrete a chemical when we're afraid. I think that dog smelled it when it saw me in the neighborhood. And when I was done with this trip, my clothes smelled so bad I had to just throw them away. I had excreted seven days of the chemical that I'll just call fear. Again, fear is natural. But when the enemy takes the natural human reaction intended for our survival and twists it and morphs it into a lifestyle or a mindset of fear, then it becomes a giant. Then it becomes a stronghold. Being afraid for a moment does not dishonor God. But when that moment is compounded into a lifestyle or a mindset of being afraid, fearful all the time, the enemy turns fear into a lifestyle of being afraid. And that is antithetical to the Spirit of God, to live that kind of a lifestyle, to have that kind of mindset, a mindset of fear, to live in constant fear. You are living antithetical to the Spirit of God who is in you. As a Christ follower, God didn't give us, Paul said this to Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. We are supposed to navigate life that way. And Jesus did not go to the grave, defeat sin and death, so that we could live fearful, so that we could live riddled with fear, fear riddled lives. And he understands that things make us afraid, but he doesn't want the enemy to change that into a lifestyle or a mindset of paralyzing fear. And yet a lot of people, a lot of people who call themselves Christians live that way. We put a casual phrase on it. We call it Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy's Law. And it's true, we live in a broken world and a spiritual battle zone. There's stuff that happens, but we cannot turn our lives into Murphyisms, absorb the mentality that all of life is going to go wrong all of the time. Yet again, ask yourself, am I one of those Murphy's Law people? Am I doing that? I think one of the 
craziest things about living in Yakima, the thing that drives me crazy is that there is so much negativism and pessimism and fear from people who call this their home. We are the worst ambassadors for our place of I mean, to me, the latest manifestation of this is this downtown plaza. I don't want that downtown plaza. I, I can't walk a half a block. I need that, par I want that parking lot. Save the parking lot. Let's not build this thing that would make us the, the jewel of central Washington. Let's keep the asphalt there. I can't walk a half a block to go to a restaurant. And when we do do something great, that negativity, negativism, that's a tough word for me. I try not to be negative. You know, I was on the city council when we redid the whole Yakima Avenue, and we had the same negative comments coming, and yet we still did it. You're ruining our town, you're tearing up the sidewalks, and yet 50 plus million dollars in, in private investment came, and it's still happening because we made that decision to do something great, and there are still critics. And I think it's the product of Murphy's Law, which has a foundation in some truth, but it's extrapolated into this worldview of negativism, pessimism, and fear. We live trapped in that worldview. And here's the reality. We have a spiritual adversary who makes sure if he is allowed to supply the soundtrack for our lives. Now let me give you an example of what that soundtrack might sound like. I'm worthless. I can't get anything right. I'll never be any different. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. This always happens to me. I'm not pretty enough. I'll never be any different. I'm not enough. The soundtrack. And all of a sudden, Murphy's Law becomes the gospel truth for us. And our reality is we don't live in a vacuum. The adversary will use anything that he can, our environment, uh, our own strong wills, to try to control us. We want to manage our own affairs. We don't want to give too much to God. And then all of a sudden, we're overwhelmed in life. The enemy puts a soundtrack into our lives. And you need to know he is relentless in it. And I would say to you, we know the voice. And it sounds like this. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. This always happens to me. I'm not pretty enough. I'll never be any different. I'm not enough. Here's the message today. It does not have to be that way. There is a giant killer in the valley. And he's in your valley right now. He has silenced fear. And his name is Jesus. And you don't have to buck up. You don't have to suck him up. You don't have to pick up your five stones. I always thought I was David in the story. But I'm not David in the story. Jesus is David in the story. He's come into the valley. And Goliath has fallen. He has silenced fear. Fear, Jesus has. Silenced fear. So there really is a third way. We don't have to stand and fight. We don't have to flee or flight. There is a third way, and that third way is faith. Again, we don't have to fight or flight. 365 times our Bible tells us to fear not. One for every day of the year. Why did God do that? Because he knew that we would deal with this, with fear. And he wants us to choose this middle road, this third option, which is faith, to believe that God is in our story. I mean, I want you to believe that God is in your story. Because you have to know that faith and fear are linked 
And that fear is just literally faith in the enemy. Fear is telling you that the devil's plan will succeed, that the devil will wash you down the tube, that the devil will cause all of your plans and your hopes and your dreams to evaporate, that the devil is going to win the day. And if we live with that kind of a fear mindset, a lifestyle of fear, we're putting our faith in the enemy. And yet the option to that is to put our faith in Jesus. I want to tell you another recognizable story. It comes out of Matthew chapter 8. They've just had this incredible time, the disciples and Jesus. Amazing things have happened. Really cool stuff has happened. And they get into this boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is this really large lake, wonderful place. And here's how the story goes. They got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. I mean, this is a storm. And and here's what I know as I'm talking to you today. There are people sitting right here, right now, who have a lot of water, who have waves coming into their boats right now. Life is happening, and it's not happening the way they'd like it to happen. Every week, multiple times during the week, people contact me and us because they are in very dark places. Storms are beating against their lives. And we won't and we don't minimize the storms that life throws at us. And when we fight, we try to bail. When we can't do that, we just give up and resign ourselves to this is just how it's going to be. And we see people do that all the time. And why are these stories in our Bible? Because there are lifetime principles in these stories. It's not by accident that this particular story is multiple times in our Bible. And the story continues, but Jesus was sleeping. Can you believe the gall of that guy to fall asleep When a storm is coming my way, he's sleeping. Doesn't he care? I mean, it's obvious that he doesn't care. It's obvious that he's paying absolutely no attention to me. He's sleeping. He's sleeping. And how many of us feel that way? Where are you, God? Where are you? But you've probably not thought of it this way. Maybe... He's just calm. Maybe he's just in control. Maybe he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. I'm going through puberty. That happens. (laughs) But the disciples are living in Murphy's Law. They've written the script, we're going to drown. It sounds a little bit like this soundtrack. I'm worthless. Uh, I can't get anything right. Mm. I'll never be any different. Uh, I'm too old. Uh, I'm too young. Mm. I'm not smart enough. Oh, wow. This always happens to me. Yeah, it does. I'm not pretty enough. Ugh. I'll never be any different. Uh-uh. I'm not enough. No, I'm not. So the disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Why are you so afraid, he asks. Why do you have such little faith? You know what he could have said? He could have gone, hello, hello. I mean, we just spent the day together. Do you remember that? We, we, we just did some miraculous, I actually did them, but some miraculous things today. We changed destinies today. It wasn't yesterday, it was today. We overrode the laws of nature today. Today we did that. He connects faith and fear, and then he calms the storm. And here's... How this story closes is it said the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves 
obey him. How would you answer that question? What kind of man is this? Who is he? Who is this giant slayer to you? Because that's what matters. What kind of a man is this? I've personally decided that he's God. He's the son of God. The antidote to fear is not courage. It is faith. You know what they could have done? They could have gone down and kind of lightly shaken him and said, hey, Jesus, man, I know you're tired because you really put it out today. You were awesome. You were awesome. But we're, we're kind of up here and the waves are coming over and, you know, we're just human. We're a little concerned. We're taking on water. We thought we should wake you and see if you might want to do something else that's really cool today. <laughs> and they would go, he would go, Oh, you guys, what incredible faith. Absolutely. Be calm. And then he'd have fallen right back to sleep. God will not gloss over our struggle. And again, many of us have storms come our way. And we choose this way. We choose the way of faith. And yet things seem to get worse. But most of us would say that we got stronger in the midst of that. We have this inner peace. We have this faith that God is ultimately in control. You know, that's the thing about Jesus. He has peace. But he also has this supernatural power, this outrageous power as the creator God. And he has a track record of showing up, of responding to the cries of his people. I believe that's who he is. He still has all of those things. So who is this man? To you. There's another law outside of Murphy's law. It's called the shepherd's law. And it says this, if something goes wrong, my shepherd will be with me and will circumvent whatever went wrong for my good and for his glory. Let me read that again. If something goes wrong, my shepherd will still be with me and will circumvent whatever went wrong for my good and his glory. A little positivity, a little faith. Jesus is in our boat. Now, if you aren't following Jesus, that's not your story. But that can change. So how do we turn fear into faith? How do you and I practically turn fear into faith. And here's the answer. It might seem simple, but it takes work. The soundtrack, not the one we've been listening to, to faith is worship. Is worship. We have to change the narrative of our story, and we do that with worship. We silence that vo voice that tells us we're not good enough, that we can't do it, that we'll never make it, with worship. And we worship this calm, supernaturally powered Savior, and we let that be the soundtrack. Then we have to create that soundtrack ourselves to de defeat the stronghold of fear, we have to create a new soundtrack and you have to do it for yourself. 365 verses tell us to fear not. Maybe we should read the verses around that and understand what the antidote is. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. They heard the giant yell and became fearful we hear Jesus speak through his word. Did you know you will be transformed if you read your Bible four times a week? Just four times a week if you will open your Bibles and replace that stinking thinking soundtrack with the soundtrack of God and what he intends to do. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. Because the absolute opposite is true. Fear faith comes from hearing true too. So what soundtrack are you listening to? That inner voice that tells you you can't? Or the voice of God that tells you that you are a child of God? Hearing that 
involving yourself in a life group, in a rooted group, so that you hear that multiple times. I don't know if you know this, but David, this one who slew the giant, wrote 73 of the 150 plus psalms that are written in our Bible. So he was a man of worship writing songs. He's a man's man. He's a warrior. He's a builder. He's a conqueror. Israel was never bigger than it was under David's leadership. And then yet in one of the songs that he wrote, Psalm 34, it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. He delivered me from all my fears. Make a worship soundtrack. Listen to it. It's easy. If you've got a phone, you can put worship music on there. You have to do this. That song that we sang this morning was purposefully picked for us today that fear doesn't stand a chance when we stand in your love. A song by Josh Beckett. Songs rooted in the word of God. I don't get to talk about this very often, but we won a national championship in American Legion baseball when I was 18 years old, and we had a song, and that song was Bachman Turner Overdrive, Taking Care of Business. <laughs> and we beat everybody and won the national championship, Taking Care of Business. We need to put a song, and we need to sing it all the time. We used to sing this song when I started taking Susie to church. She couldn't figure out where that song was because all of us just grew up knowing this song. And if you know it, sing along with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him of creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's called the doxology. Great song. I visited a church the other day and they sang it. It brought tears to my eyes. Worship is the soundtrack of faith. And know this as I close. When the enemy speaks, he lies. He is the father of lies. There's no truth in him, and yet it's his natural language. And he will speak lies to you and manipulate everything that he can to cause you to live far from what God has for you. But Jesus speaks the truth. And he has defeated the giant of fear. Fear has fallen we just have to appropriate that. Goliath falls when we worship. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this truth. And I thank you that it is the truth. It's not a lie. It's not something conceived out of anything but the truth that comes from your word and from your love for us. And my prayer for us today is that if there are any in this room who are battling a mindset or a lifestyle of fear, uh, any that are battling negativism and, and, and pessimism and, and, and fear, Lord, that you would powerfully show up and deliver us from this giant in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You know, I think it's important sometimes to, to just really respond. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you have fear, if you have a soundtrack that's telling you you're unworthy, that you can't do it, that, you, that, you, that you're lost forever, whatever that soundtrack is telling you, then you know it's a lie. And yet it still has power over your life and you'd like to be free of it today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you just raise your hand and say, I want to be free. I want to be free of that soundtrack. Lord, you see these lifted hands. That's all we have to do is respond. It's all we have to do. So, Lord, move through the lives. And I pray for them that not only will it be this moment, but every moment that they hear that soundtrack, that they would just rebuke it because it's a lie. They are worthy. They are worthy. You died for them. So, Lord, give us the strength to continue to rest in your, in, in your track record, in your incredible power, 
in your peace. I always give this opportunity. You might have walked in here. I mentioned it earlier. Jesus isn't in your boat if you haven't said yes to him yet. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you and you've decided that in this moment, in this day, you're going to say yes to him, that you want to say yes to him, again, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you lift your hand and say, that's me. I've never said yes to Jesus. I need to do that today. I need to take that step. I see that hand. That's awesome. I'm going to pray a prayer. I see that hand in the back. That's great. Yeah. Some of you might need to reintroduce yourself to Jesus. Some of you, this is a first time. You didn't raise your hand, but it's the first time. It's so simple, just a simple little prayer. And we're all going to say it because that's how we do life around here. So please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I say yes to your peace. I say yes to your supernatural power. I say yes to your track record that you're going to set me free. You're going to forgive me of my sin. You're going to lead me in life. I say yes to the salvation that you're offering. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's applaud with those that made that decision. Thank you.